Okay, hold on. Okay, we got a question. Let's see here. Spotlight video. All right. I'm going to um, go ahead and mute everyone. All right, there it goes. So everybody should be muted. And um, the reason we do that, I don't, it's not to be rude. It's so we can, you guys can hear everything that's going on and everything that we're doing. I am recording this. So if you, for some reason, have to go, um, then it's going to be recorded. If you're in here, you're going to get the link. Um, but just give me a thumbs up. Everybody can hear me clearly. The mic is loud enough. Okay, cool, cool. So, um, what? Oh, yeah. So, guys, um, I really hope you had a chance to see the one we did two weeks ago, part one. Uh, the reason being is it's going to be a lot more rich if you have seen part one. But nevertheless, if you haven't, it's okay. Please, once you see this, then go back to part one in case you haven't uh, been able to see that. Um, to me, this is life changing. And it really helps, you know, a lot. Um, let me um, let's start in prayer. Lord God, I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people. Lord, without you, we can't do anything. But with you, we can do all things. And we just pray for our hearts to be open and our minds to be open, to be able to receive what it is that, that you have for us today, Lord God, for each and every person that is here. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, um, identity, who are you, is what we're going to be doing part two today. And this is the part where, if you remember last week, um, I mean two weeks ago, it was about where we are at in Christ, and kind of like from Adam and Eve and, and what happened. Um, but this is really important too, because a lot of people don't think about this. But what has been happening in the heavenly places during our earthly places, our earthly times, you know? So we can understand there's the reality of our reality and there's a reality of heaven. And so what was happening during that time? What was happening during the fall during that time? What was happening during creation at that time? What was happening um, through everything of the cross, everything Jesus did on the cross? What was going on in heaven? Because Think about it. If if when Jesus died on the cross, that literally it turned black and there was an earthquake. So what happened in the heavens during that time? So we're going to talk about kind of like um, we're going to take like like if as if two weeks ago was zoomed in on us. Now we're going to go backwards and see a bigger picture of everything else. And it, and I think it's it's going to help make what we learned two weeks ago, even more clear, you know? And um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, which as you know, I don't have as many pictures this time, uh, but I do have, well, this is this guy, I showed this last week, but I wanna show it again because we don't wanna be the person on the left side. We don't wanna be the guy that's on the girl or the guy on faulty, foundation because you're always going to be stumbling you're always going to be falling you're always going to fail you want to be the guy that is real happy right there on the right side because he has built his foundation steady and strong and solid so um what i want to talk about in this first part of part two is i want to talk about angels and demons you know uh angels are mentioned almost 300 times in the Bible. Why do I make that point? Because there are parts of the Bible that have one verse about a subject and entire denominations are built along that one verse. So obviously, then if angels are mentioned three over almost 300 times, then we want to take a little closer look as to what it is their function is, what their function is not. You know, and um, I think that's that's really important, guys. So, uh, a definition um, of 
you know, the Bible says the Lord of hosts. And I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. I'm going to mention a couple of little key words that I mentioned last time that are going to kind of go together with what we're talking about today. Uh, but a Lord of hosts is basically the, the God or the general of the army. So a literal name for God is a general of an army. Well, why do I make that a point? Because if he's the Lord of hosts, then who's the army? Well, the army is his creation. The soldiers are his angels. So he's the Lord of an army. So that tells us one thing, many things actually, but one of the things that it tells us is that number one, he is a commander. He's a supreme commander, five-star general, whatever you want to call it, something like that. And if somebody is an army, that means they're at the disposal of the commander, whatever the commander orders, that's what they're going to do. So that gives us a bigger picture of how he created the angels. He didn't create the angels in the same way God created us. For instance, we have a different sense of a free will. You and I have the free will every day to follow God or not follow God. You know, he didn't make us to be military. He didn't make us. He gave us a free will. We can be lazy on the couch or we can go climb Mount Everest. You know, so we have this huge range compared to angels. They were created with specific assignments um, because they are soldiers and he is the Lord of those soldiers. So, for instance, um, there's some animals, for instance, the turtles, they were created in them to lay the turtles in the, in the beach. And as soon as those turtles hatch, they instinctively know their job is to run toward the water. You know, that's why you, saw, you see all those little turtles. Every animal, everything has something pre-programmed in them where they instinctively know what to do. Well, angels, who are the soldiers of God, have instinctive assignments that they are called to do. And we got we to gotta realize that because angels are not something that just go around hanging around. When you go to see military and they're marching, they're not just mar walking any old way they feel like it. They have specific things that they do. So angels were created in a very strategic, militarized form. And that doesn't necessarily mean everyone is built to be a soldier because just like now if you, you got if you go to any of our say the army or marines they're not all fighting some are communications some are transportation some are you know so there's different things but nevertheless they are soldiers so in colossians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16 we read this last time but we're going to read it again it says he talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So we know just reading this scripture, that there's thrones, there's dominions, where somebody has a, a, a dominion over a place. There's principalities, I explained before, is that a, a prince has a principality. So the very fact that the Bible talks about principalities means that there's princes that are over those principalities and there's powers. Why do I say that? Because a lot of times when we talk about angels and demons, we talk about how different they are, but we never really sit and think how similar they are other than some are fallen and some are righteous and holy. But they are still created to be militarized. And we have to get that in our mind. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 says this. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So we know, obviously, that we are not fighting flesh and blood. We are, that's not what we're fighting. 
um, we are fighting something in the spiritual realm. But instead of flesh and blood, we're fighting against principalities. There it is again. We're fight our fight. It's against these principalities that are controlled by princes that are in place or against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this age. So that scripture says that there are rulers. There are, you know, like when we attacked Afghanistan and toppled the Taliban government, I don't know if you remember or not, but the people that controlled everything were these um, warlords. They were basically drug dealers that they each had their location. So uh, uh, Afghanistan was no, no longer had a central government, but they had strongholds that warlords had. Well, in the same way, this Ephesians chapter 6, 11, 12 says, says that we're against the rulers of the darkness, rulers as in plural. So there are many. There are many. So the demons I might fight in San Francisco are different from the ruler that's over New York. There are rulers, it says in plural, of the darkness of this age. So another thing it says in that verse, he goes, we're against spiritual host. Remember what host means? Armies. So we are against spiritual armies of wickedness in the heavenly places. In scripture, it talks about the third heaven because our atmosphere is the first heaven and the spiritual realm is the second heaven and the third heaven is where God is at and where, where, where heaven is at. So there's like this disconnect that we have because we are here in the first heaven and when we send our prayers to the third heaven, there's a middle heaven that's trying to block that prayer or trying to block the answer. And that is scripture. And we're going to talk about that too. So there's a constant fight of communication. You know, the first thing the military does when they attack another nation is they destroy their communication. Because if you can destroy the communication, you can stop them from being able to communicate and talk, therefore, you have pockets of soldiers that have no way to communicate to central command. So it is very interesting here that according to scripture, we're fighting against a spiritual army of wickedness. So I want to keep pushing in, in, keep pushing it in your mind that demons are not like the movie Ghostbusters. If you remember Ghostbusters, um, the city forced them to let all the ghosts out. And all of a sudden, all these weird demons are all flying everywhere, causing havoc all over New York City. And I think a lot of times, movies have made us feel like demons are like that. In actuality, um, demons are not like that. They're very strategic. They are soldiers. They are trained. And they are spiritual armies of wickedness. So this is the enemy that we're fighting. And um, just in that itself, I mean, we're barely in the first 15 minutes of this, but you should start thinking like, this is crazy. So if we are fighting an enemy that is strategic and militarized, then maybe I should raise the bar in how I fight this enemy. Because I, I think it's easier to fight an enemy if we think demons are just like running around like gremlins. But that is not what we see in the Bible. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, the first part of that verse, Revelation 2, 13, um, it says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, is, you know, so even scripture in Revelation talks about the throne of Satan being at a certain place. Satan is not like God, nothing like God. He cannot hear our thoughts. He cannot speak to us nor answer us all at the same time. Only God. God is the only being that exists that can communicate with all of us simultaneously at the same time. God can be here and on Mars and in a universe that we could never reach all at the same time. The Bible says that the universe cannot even contain God. 
You know, so Satan is always centralized. He's always in one place. But he, this, so this is why he has to operate this way. So you have Satan, and he has people in charge, like a pyramid, in a sense, like a military. There's branches in, that just break down, and this is the only way he can operate or control. He can't do it any other way because Satan is not like God. He is not at all places at all times. It is impossible because only God can do that. Okay. So um, there's, I'm not going to, there's no way to be exhaustive on this, meaning there's no way we can know every single rank that there is for angels. But we do see a few of them, and I want to talk about a couple of them, because I think another misconception is we think angels are just angels. For instance, if I asked you, do angels have wings? Most people would say, yeah, but scripture never says that angels have wings. Okay, let me, let me explain. There's an angel in Genesis 3, 24, that is called the cherubim. Okay. That one, it says, for instance, Genesis 3, 24, it says, so he drove out the man after the fall, after Adam and Eve, he drove out Adam and Eve, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So we know now they're cherubim. What's one thing we know is that they're guards and they have swords. So these cherubim, we can say, are pretty militarily based. I mean, they have swords. They have a weapon and they're not afraid. They're, they're, their weapons are not there like costumes. I once asked somebody, why does the Bible say angels have swords? Do they use them? And they're like, well, I don't know. I never thought of that. I'm like, so they just have them for costume? I believe angels have swords because they are trained to use that weapon against an enemy. It's a real weapon that can really harm an enemy. So we know that cherubim are, at least in this place, are somewhat like a guard. Uh, in Exodus chapter 25, verses 18 and 20, it goes into the description of the Ark of the Covenant, the, the box, the golden box that was in the holy of all holies in the temple. And God said, I want you to create this golden box and put the Ten Commandments in there and the rod of iron in there and a jar of manna. And I want you to inlay it in gold inwardly and outwardly. And on the top is an empty seat that represents where I sit. And you're gonna have you're gonna create two cherubims guarding and hovering over each other over my mercy seat. And that's what it says here in Exodus 25, 18 and 20. It says, And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work, you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on one end, and the other cherub on the other end, and you shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim will stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face each other. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You know, I don't know about you, and this might just be opinion, but this reminds me of the secret service. This reminds me of the high level military that they're in the throne room of God. These are the guys, like if you're into Star Wars and you saw, I forgot which one, those guys in red, the guard, the red guard. They're around the emperor. These are the guys that mean business. The cherubim are no joke, okay? These guys are warriors. The very fact that, that God said, I want you to represent my seat with two cherubims and their wings covering over my mercy seat. So um, that's just interesting, you know? Uh, another one that it mentions is the seraphim. Seraphim. It's count, it sounds like cherubim, but it's with the S, seraphim. Many scholars have said these are the same beings. I don't know, but I, since it says two names, I still want to talk about it a little bit. In Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, it says that in the year that King Uzziah died, so this is Isaiah seeing this vision. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. So, you know, you know, the long train at the, it was so long, it just completely covered the entire temple. And it says, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with the other two, it was flying. And one cried out to the other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Remember, host means army. So holy is the Lord of the armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they kept singing that back and forth. It says, and the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. You know, so Isaiah sees this, and he's like, this is insane. He sees the throne. He sees the seraphim crying out to each other, the train of his robe completely covering the temple, and the whole place was shaking. Um, I have this picture here that I want to share. Let's see. So there's Isaiah in the throne room of God. And he says these words. He says, so I said, he says, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Remember the Lord of the armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. So Isaiah sees the seraphim fly to him, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. So again, we see seraphim, that word seraphim brought up. Now, another part of scripture mentions an these animals, these beings, these things, these creatures, actually, not animals, I'm sorry. Um, but it calls them living creatures, but it sounds very similar, but I still want to mention them. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Okay, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. It says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, sounds familiar, were full of eyes around and within and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So the cherubim, the seraphim sound a little similar. They sound also a little different. But the living creatures and the seraphim sound like the same one. Either way, these are high-ranking angels. These are the angels that are literally in the throne room. They're not the soldier out in the front lines. They're the ones guarding the president. They're the ones that are right there. You know, so um, these guys are the ones that have wings. That's where people say angels have wings. The Bible never, ever mentions angels having wings. It mentions seraphim having wings. And these are the high-ranking angels. So you got to remember something, guys. Um, Remember, there's, there isn't, other than the sin and wickedness, demons were part of these ranks. So I'm hoping you're seeing yourself. So that means there could have been some cherubim that went bad. There could have been some seraphim that went bad. And there could have been some regular angels that went bad. I'm, right now, I'm letting you know, Satan was the highest ranking of them all. He was in the throne room 24-7. He was always there, you know, and just to show you what kind, like, like people might say, why do people, why do these other demons listen to Satan? Because they were created to be soldiers and soldiers follow after their commander. And Satan was one of the highest ranking, if not the highest ranking angel or being heavenly being to ever be created by God. Okay. There's another one we've heard of, the archangel. There's an archangel, okay? The first time we see a mention of the archangel is in the book of Daniel. So in the book of Daniel, 
Um, in verse, let's see, chapter 8, 15 to 16. Daniel, who was a prophet um, at this time, Daniel and them, they had already been taken out of Israel. They had been taken over and overrun and taken to a different nation. And Daniel was in prayer. So in Daniel 8, 15, 16, it says, Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. So this archangel looks like a man. It doesn't look like a creature that had four wings and eyes all over. He says it looked like a man. So we, again, the wings, just that, I think that's just from art, art, artists that have painted angels with wings. So we just assume all angels have wings, but he said it looked like a man. He goes, and, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So for the first time, we see that these angels have names. This one was named Gabriel. And um, so he comes and he appears before Daniel. Okay. Now, this is interesting because a couple chapters more. This is, we just read Daniel 8, but if we jump to Daniel chapter 10, 13. Daniel 10, 13. Look what Daniel says. This is a trip. He says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. This is an angel speaking to Daniel. See, let me, let me lay the foundation here. Daniel had been asking, he was in prayer asking an answer from God. He didn't get an answer for three weeks. All of a sudden, this angel shows up three weeks later and says, hey, Daniel, um, I would have been here right away. Remember I said we're in the first heaven, and then there's the spiritual second heaven, and then there's the third heaven. So basically what this angel was saying to him, he goes, man, I was trying to get a message back to you, but it took me 21 days because of the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So he couldn't have been talking about a man, a physical man that was over Persia, because there's no way a man would hold back an angel for 21 days. We know he's talking about a prince of the air. Remember what I said? We fight against principalities. So there's a prince, a demonic being that is high ranking that was over Persia. And this angel was telling Daniel, man, I was trying to get this message to you, but this prince of the air, the kingdom of Persia, fought with me for 21 days. I couldn't get through. And then the verse is, and behold, Michael. So now we hear the name of another angel. We heard Gabriel already, but now we hear Michael. And look what he says. He says, Michael, one of the chief princes. There's a rank again. He came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Okay, we got to look deep into these scriptures, right? So we have this angel that Daniel prayed. God gave an answer and sent a messaging angel. This guy's a messenger. He's not a warrior. He's not a fighter. He's like the post office. He's bringing an answer back, but this this demon of war was holding him from going through for 21 days. So what happens? Michael, who is a war angel, comes to fight. And because of Michael coming, he says he came to help because he goes, other than Michael coming, I was all alone. He goes, uh, uh, left alone there with the kings of Persia. So we see the spiritual fight right here very blatantly and it's, 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 it's crazy, you know, because it helps us to understand how the heavenly things work. Because we, we understand, we're always hearing sermons or preaching about how 
we fight against spiritual battles. We destroy the works of the enemy. We pray and cast demons out. But a lot of times we don't take into account the fight that is actually ha ha happening in the heavenly places on that realm. You know, and this I'm hoping is starting to make you be like, okay, okay, I'm starting to see this. I'm seeing this. So in the Gospel of Luke now, Luke chapter 1, verse 19. Uh, this is now New Testament. And this is now talking about the angel that came to visit Mary. The angel that came and it, that name Gabriel pops up again. The same one that appeared to Daniel. Luke 1.19 says, And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Uh, I want to make sure, uh, either he's talking, let me confirm who he's talking to here. Hold on. Because obviously he's not talking to Mary in this specific verse. But um, Luke 119, he's talking to uh, Zechariah. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, the father of John the Baptist. Okay, so he's talking to him. And again, if, if we just skim through it, we just be like, oh, man, that's cool. An angel talk. But we could skip over him giving us a glimpse of what he does. He goes, I'm the one who stands in the very presence of God. That is, that is really, really high ranking. He's like, I'm not just a foot soldier. I stand in the throne room. And I was sent to speak to you just to tell you about your son that you're going to have, John the Baptist. So John the Baptist being born, that came from straight headquarters. That came from the top. And not only that, God sent his top right-hand man. He sent this angel that he trusted the most. And he sent Gabriel, the same one that he sent to speak to Daniel. So we see Gabriel as a messenger. Um, if you go to Jude 9, Jude is one small. Oh, somebody's trying to get in. There it is. Hold on a second. Yeah, Jude is... Um, one, it's just one chapter, but in Jude verse 9, it says this. It says, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring him against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So there, remember, we saw Michael just fighting in the book of Daniel, and we see him here again fighting with the devil over the body of Moses. Because we know if you read in Moses, Moses didn't go into the promised land. He went up to the mountain to die by himself. And um, for whatever reason, Michael had to fight for Moses' body. The only thing I can assume, again, this is just an assumption, is that maybe Satan want, wanted to use the body of Moses to create a religion after Moses. That's the only thing that I've thought of. I mean, it could be many more things. I don't know. But uh, well, for whatever reason, Michael, the warrior angel, was fighting. You know, was fighting with him. So um, that's, that's one thing we see. Um, I know I'm going on and on about this, but this is real important to establish what it is that we're talking about guys. And um, I like the fact that we can do this and completely be where I had, I don't have to be all hurrying, you know, and can do this in the right way that I feel like is, is something that we need. So a um, couple other verses about these angels before we go into something else. It's this. It says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 11. 
this is where it's talks the first time that we're going to see that it talks about just regular angels as if an angel can be regular but nevertheless in revelation 7 11 it says all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures the seraphim and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped him so the angels, the one, it's not an archangel, not a seraphim, not a cherubim, not, not the uh, four living creatures, regular angels. And they all began to worship God in Revelation 7, 11. If we back up a little bit to Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 and 12 is interesting also. It says, then I looked, this is John, the, the apostle John. He says, then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures. So remember those living creatures also? The elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, singing, uh, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing you know so we see now that there was archangels cherubim seraphim living creatures and what the bible calls angels you know and um so there is that guy so um let's see i want to get to okay Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 14. We are in, in about 15, 10, 15 minutes, guys. We're going to take a five-minute break. So I'm um, just letting you know in case you're wondering, like, oh, man, I got to do this or I got to do that. In about 10 minutes or so, we're going to take a break. So in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and 14, it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. This is when Jesus was born. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this sign will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, remember host means army, praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. So there it is again. It's talking about regular angels. It doesn't say they have wings. It doesn't say anything like that. As we know, the ones with wings are actually the ones that are in the throne room, the ones that are very high ranking. And um, I, I say that, and I keep saying that because I'm, I'm going to get to a point when we talk about demons. Uh, in 2 Kings, check this out. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17 and 20, it says this. It says, and Elisha prayed. So Elisha was a prophet, and... God kept telling him when the armies that were fighting against Israel, where they were going to meet. So then um, Elisha would go tell the king, and the king would always counter their attacks. And the kings of these other nations were getting mad. They're like, how does this guy know? He must be a spy. He must be something. So one day they surrounded the house of Elisha. Okay, and this is what this is saying. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that you may see. So what happened was, um, Elisha's servant woke him up saying, Elisha, we're in trouble. We're completely surrounded by armies. They're going to kill us. And Elisha comes out and he sees this whole vast of different armies. And he says, Lord, open his eyes so he can see what I see. It says, then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike these people, I pray, with blindness. 
and he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. This is kind of side note, but I want you to understand the power you and I have in our mouth. The very fact God didn't say, hey, I'm going to strike him with blindness. God didn't say anything. He gave it up. He, led, he allowed Elisha to operate in his own authority because if Elisha would have said, you know what? I want all of their heads to spin off. But Elisha didn't say that. God was going to honor the word of Elisha. That's why we have to be careful because we can bless somebody or we can curse somebody. As believers, if you don't understand the authority that we have. So Elisha says, you know what, God? They're coming, strike them with blindness. And because of that, God did it. That's how much he trusts you and I. So anyways, um, he says, strike them with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and there they were inside Samaria. So we see that they are, they're an army of fire. They have horses and chariots of fire. I want you to understand, they don't have horses and chariots just for fun. It's not Halloween. They're not playing dress up. They have horses because, and chariots to fight. They are an army. I, I want to like pound this in our minds and in our hearts that angels were created to be an army and to fight and they are trained. Okay. So um, another verse is Genesis 28, 12. Genesis 28, 12, guys. It says this, that um, it's talking about uh, um, Jacob. It says, then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. So he had a dream and he, in the dream, he saw this huge ladder that went up to heaven and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Just a verse. But, you know, I'm talking about angels and, and that's, I wanted to bring up some instances where it mentions angels. Uh, also, now I'm jumping back again to the New Testament. It says this, and this is cool. In Matthew 28, verses 2 and 5, this is awesome, right? When, after the third day of Jesus being in the grave, this is, this is powerful. I, I love this, actually. It says, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came through from the third heaven, smashed right through the second heaven, came down, descended from heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I love that verse. I'll tell you why. Because the very fact that he sat on it, that, <laughs> I said this so many times, there's nowhere else Satan would be at in the world. Remember, he can only be at one place at one time. Where else would Satan be than to be at the graveside of Jesus if Jesus said repeatedly, I'm going to rise again? Do you not think that Satan was there along with his cronies, along with his hoodlums, along with his soldiers? Of course, Satan had to have been there. Can you imagine Satan there laughing at the fact that the body of Jesus was rotting in this grave and there was nothing the believers could do about it? All of a sudden, it's like in the spirit realm, it seems like a Halley's comet comes smashing through the second heaven, come like a comet, like a lightning flash, and hits that rock so bad that the rock rolls away. And then what does the angel do? He crosses his arms and sits on it, says, yeah, do something now. Whoo, man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it says here that he sat on it, man. For an angel, the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. And his countenance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Man. 
This angel was so fearsome, so fierce, that the men that were guarding passed out. And that same angel that, that brought fear to them looks at the followers of Jesus, the women. See, this is why I say there's a difference between weakness and meekness. This angel that came like a lightning meekly looked to the women and says, don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. The same angel that brought fear looked at the women and spoke softly to them. That is beautiful, man. That is amazing. And, and I love that. You know, I love that. Um, I want to talk about this one more part. We're going to take a break. We are going to Daniel chapter 4. And I'm going to jump verses from 13 to 17 to 23. Daniel 4, verses 13, 17, and 23. It says this in 13. Daniel says, I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed. And there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. Oh, there's another clue. So some of these are watchers. Isn't it the guys in the army? They're like, they're in the front, and they're like this. I saw in the visions in my head while on my bed, and there was a, a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. Verse 17, it says, this decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he wills and sets it over the lowest of men so this so these watchers make decisions these watchers play moves these watchers are watching us there are watchers in heaven literally seeing your ministry, guys. They're literally seeing over the house of rest or this ministry or that. They're watching and making reports to the Lord saying, oh, man, you should see what these guys are doing over here. You should see they're in a Zoom room right now on a Saturday morning. You know what I mean? And they're just reporting this thing, you know. So it's like on a Saturday afternoon, you know, so there's watchers. In verse 23, it says, and inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, and bound with the band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beast of the field till seven times pass over him. So anyways, my point is that we know now a lot of things about angels. Just in this last hour, we've learned that there's cherubim, there's seraphim, there's living creatures, there's regular angels, there's archangels, there's watchers. Each and every one of them are a army or a host, and God is the Lord of that host. He's the Lord of that army. You know, so uh, some are also messengers. We know, according to scripture, just in this last hour, that that um, um, some of them are messengers, but they're not fighters. So they were held back for 21 days until a warring angel came to help fight. So this is a real thing. I know it sounds like a movie, but what do you think the ideas of movies come from? You know, it's, so it's like this stuff is real, guys. And so when we are fighting this battle, like it's crazy, like I was watching this Star Wars movie and you see like hundreds of people and lightsabers and, and all these lasers in the ground. And then you see these things and, and they're flying and flying and trying to get each other. And then in outer space, there are these big old battleship things fighting. There's fighting on all levels, guys. So we are not alone in this battle. We are not alone. We are here on the ground. We're the ground soldiers. We're here causing, we're the ones that are kicking doors down, throwing flashbangs into the houses to save people into Christ and the kingdom. But I want you to understand, that there are places and battles that are going on in the heavenly places right now. Like, it's like, so there's some things that we fight and there's other things that these angels are constantly fighting. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but um, guys, I want to take a five minute break and I'm going to put a, a, a timer on here. So we'll know, you will know when to come back and, um, and, and we'll be right. Well, wait, 
it's not letting me do it. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. So, um, but yeah, guys, we're going to uh, just take a quick five minutes and see you later.
All right. Okay. <clears throat> huh? Yeah. All right, guys, can you hear me? We're going to be starting up again. Okay, guys, is everybody on? Give me thumbs up if you're here. So last week we told you guys to text um, identity, identity to the 209-400-9725 number. And I'm gonna pick out that name now. I only had nine people that responded to it. So this will be the person who will be winning the identified shirt. And please make sure that when you do that, when we're done with this class, make sure you email to housearrestchurch at gmail.com and send me your address, okay? All right, here we go. There's only nine names in there. Mike Gonzalez. Okay, Mike, so make sure you email me. Congratulations. I will send you an identified shirt. Send me your size and your address, okay? Who won? Mike Gonzalez. Ole! <laughs> Where is he at? Is he on here? He's 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 with all his Raider gear. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Where is he at? Where you at, Mike? Unmute yourself. He's in Vegas. Como que Vegas ni que nada. ¿Dónde estás, Mike? <laughs> yeah, I don't see him. Did he leave? Well, either way, we'll let him know. Too many of you guys. Okay, perfect. Oh, there he is. No, he's not. All right, well, we'll get a hold of him, uh, babe. All right. Hi, my buddy, Enoch. Hey. There's Enoch and Lorena. Is that Mondo? Hi, Sharon. Hey, Raina. Hey, Ruthie. Hi. Hi, Paul. Sharon, you hear me? <laughs> Who's that? Sharon, I always forget and mute this button. <laughs> hi, I said hi to you earlier today and you didn't hear me, but I'm glad that you unmuted it. <laughs> I, I kind of heard it. I go, did she say Ruth? You know, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. and mode, I don't know. I don't hear. <laughs> yes, I'm so happy to have all you guys here. Okay, love guys. You love you too. Love you all. Okay, let's. All right, I'm going to mute. Okay. 
next. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. He's mm -hmm. muted. Pastor, you're muted. I can't hear you, Brother David. There. How about now? We can hear you now. Okay. So now let me mute everyone. There it goes. All right. Sorry, guys. So I'm glad I didn't say a whole bunch. Um, what I was saying is that even though we talked about some of the responsibilities, um, we do know that the angels, I, um, and a lot of times in comedy or movies, we see them just floating in clouds playing harps. But we know now, just through some of the scripture that we went through, that they have their assignments, that they're very military-minded, they're strategic, and they were created to obey like a soldier. You know, they, they know their marching orders, and that is it. A real true soldier will follow his task all the way through. He doesn't pay attention what's on this side, what's on that side. A soldier is going to do what he's called to do. So we see that they have heavenly responsibilities. You know, we know that, for instance, Gabriel, the, um, he's a, there's never mention of Gabriel having a weapon. Uh, but it says he's a mighty one of God. He's, I mean, he's the one that came and, and gave a lot of the messages and brought a message, you know? So, um, and we see that he was in Daniel um, 9.21. That's a verse we read earlier. It says, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So Daniel was praying and Gabriel came down to give him a message. Maybe that's where we people got that he had wings uh, because it says that he came flying swiftly. We don't, we don't know. In Luke 119, we see Gabriel mentioned again. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. So we know that Gabriel was not an angel of war, but he was high ranking to the point where the very message of, of, of John the Baptist, the very message of Mary being pregnant, it was Gabriel that God trusted to carry that message. So we know that Gabriel is highly, highly trusted. You know, <clears throat> in um, Luke one twenty six, it says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Lazarus, Nazareth. You know, so um, we know that angels are also messengers. They are warriors. They are guards. They are watchers. Um, they have a lot of different things that they do. Okay. So now we're going to talk about demons now. Okay. And, and I want to say this. I said it earlier, but I need to say it again that demons are fallen angels. So in the same way you and I, if you were funny before Christ, you're still funny in Christ. If you were a serious person before Christ, you might still be a serious person now. God doesn't change who you are. He just changes the direction toward Christ that you're going. So angels were created to be soldiers. 
So just because they're fallen angels doesn't mean they're no longer soldiers. They are just now following a different commander. So demons are angels, but they just are no longer holy anymore. Everything that scriptures teach about the nature of angels, except holiness, is still true of demons. This is why it took so long to establish the different callings, the different offices that angels hold. It's still true of demons. They just have a different commander now. Demons are angels, but they're unholy angels. They are not holy. They are not righteous. They are wicked, but they are still soldiers. So um, <clears throat> they have chosen to rebel against God, and yet they have, retained, they have retained a defiled and sinful nature since that time. Okay, so for instance, we, we know according to scripture, I know some scholars disagree with this, but for the most part, we believe that Satan was the, the highest ranking angel of all. And he sat in the throne room of God, seeing everybody worship God, and he became jealous. He wanted to be exactly like that. He wanted that worship. We know that he was a worshiping angel. The Bible says that when Satan was created, he was created with instruments in his body. Like if you ever thought of a perfect voice, it would have been Satan's. He was not a fighting warrior. He was not a, 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 um, an angel with a flaming sword, a chariot, and horses. Lucifer was a worship leader. He was a worship leader and was in the throne room created to worship. We see that Michael was created for war. So remember, angels don't jump around. Just like now, you're not in the Air Force one day, and the next day you're a, a, a Marine grunt. You're not a tunnel rat that goes in Vietnam in the tunnels, and the next day you're flying a jet. That only happens in Rambo movies. But in real life, soldiers stick to what it is that they were trained to do. You know? So um, what's it called? Uh, in Daniel 10, 13, I know we read it again, but... It says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So we know Michael is a straight fighter. Michael is a warrior. Satan is not. Satan was a worship leader. You know, so in Daniel chapter 10, verse 20 and 21, look what happens. So we know that Daniel was praying. And an answer was being sent back, but it took 21 days for the angel to come. In verse 20, Daniel 10, 20 and 21, it says, Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? So this angel finally makes it after 21 days. He was, And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds the upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So we see this conversation that happens with Daniel and this angel. He's like, man, I, I just, I'm tired. I just fought for 21 days. And here's the message, man. God heard you. But now I got to go back and fight some more. I got to go back into the battle. Um, in Colossians, we started with this, but I want to read it again. 1, 15 and 16. That God, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And like I said, we know there's thrones, there's dominions, there's principalities. You know, there's a prince over principalities and there's powers. So in Ephesians chapter 6, it's interesting that Paul talks about us now as if we have now been drafted into this army because we're followers of Christ. You know, and one of the scriptures that is very clear that you and I that follow Jesus, guys, I know many of you would have never joined the military. Some of you have, and God bless you for that. But many of us said, I don't want to be a soldier. 
um, the fact that you're in Christ, you enlisted yourself. And it's not a four-year term, it's a lifetime term. You and I have been enlisted into this great army because he is the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of the armies. Ephesians chapter 6, 11, and 12 gives us a very clear glimpse of that. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Who are we fighting? These, these, we're fighting these different principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we know that there are spiritual armies of wickedness that we are going to fight against. You know, and I'm sorry, but there's nothing we can do about that. You are a soldier of Christ. It is, I know that's a cool little saying people say, but it is a biblical saying that we really, truly are a soldier of Christ. Now, we've got to remember, in the military, not every soldier is on the front line. You know, there are nurses that are in the army helping. There's medics. There's communication. There's transportation, there's soldiers, there's foot soldiers, there's all kinds of different stuff. But nevertheless, they're all soldiers from the nurse, all the way to the guy driving truck with, with food in it, and, and the cook and the soldier in the front line. The soldier in the front line, if he has no nurse to, to help him, how effective is he? The guy in the front line, how effective is he if he can't get ammunition brought to him by somebody that all they do is drive ammunition back and forth? So everybody is important and everybody plays a part in this war. Okay. In um, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 and 11, it talks about something interesting. Revelation 9, 1 through 11. It says, then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came up upon the earth, and to them was given power, and the scorpions of the earth have power. As the scorpions of the earth have power, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were the crowns of something like gold and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions and their stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And this is the part I want to get to. I know I read a whole lot just to get to this verse, but I like to you know, read things in context. Verse 11 says, and they had a, a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. So <clears throat> this scripture is basically, it's talking a lot of stuff that we can't understand. And I don't want to talk about that right now, but I want to talk about a few things that we can understand. One of them is the fact that this king was locked and trust me, I understand about being locked in solitary confinement. This king, this angel of the bottomless pit, who obviously was a very high-ranking angel, was locked all the way into the end. So right now, as we speak, this angel is locked away. Remember when I said that Satan was not a fighting uh, uh, an angel? He was a worship leader. So what he did was something very smart. Because what he couldn't do with his own power, he, he understood strategy. He understood, like, if I can't fight, I will 
I will get people that will fight. I will, I will pull the, the worst of these, the most powerful of these angels, and I will manipulate them and turn them against God, and I will be their leader, and I'm just a worship leader, but they will do the fighting for me. So a lot of times we talk as if Satan is the worst wicked angel of all. In actuality, in one sense, he is because he's the mastermind of them. But there are many angels that are way more wicked than him, him that were so bad that they have been locked away. So if we think our wars, famines, homicides, rapes, tortures, if we think that is bad, there's the worst ones. Like, like a lot of times we go walk around, they're like, people think that they're gangster out here when the real ones are locked away for life. You and I would never come across the real gangsters because they have been locked away, locked, I mean, completely. So this guy, he's the king of the bottomless pit. This is the guy, one of them that's running the show. And he has been locked away. So that's why, remember we talked about angels. They had their places. They had this, they had that, but they had their ranks. So here is, and, and also the reason I mentioned is because we see Gabriel named, we see, uh, uh, um, what's the other angel? Michael named. So now in, in the demonic world, we see the name of this one, Abaddon or Apollon, or however you name, say his name, but he is the king of those that are on lockdown. I see him as a shot caller and he can't wait to come out. In Jude, six this this is why i talk about this in jude six verse well there's only one chapter in jude so verse six check this out a lot of people miss this it says the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode he has he capital he so god has reserved them in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. In other words, ever since the fall, there are angels that were so wicked, so evil, like they were not supposed to, like, here's the thing, right? That Satan has to obey God. Satan can do whatever he thinks he wants to do, but if God says, you're not going to touch him, then no demon's going to touch you. But these angels, they were going even beyond that and not keeping in their proper domain. Like a lot of people have wondered, like in Genesis, why does it say that fallen ones, they mated with women? Like there's a lot of things, like people are like, what is that talking about? What happened to those things? What happened to that? Well, this verse, it, it, it seems to give a little glimpse about it that even though there was fallen angels, nevertheless, they stayed in their place, even though they were wicked and fallen. But the real ones, the real ones that caused damage, the real ones that would completely just bring utter destruction, it says here, they didn't keep their proper domain. They left their own abode. In other words, they left even with it. They didn't even stay in their own lane of wickedness that God has reserved them in chains under darkness for the judgment. So they've been locked away. So if we think things are bad because Satan is running the show, Lucifer, the main one, um, the worst ones have been locked away all this time. And a lot of people don't catch that. So um, matter of fact, in the Message Bible, and of course I use that just as a side kind of um, note, it says this, it says, later he destroyed those who defected. And you know the story of the angels who didn't stick to their post. They abandoned it for other darker missions, but they are now chained and jailed in a black hole until the great judgment day. Sodom and Gomorrah, which went to sexual rack and ruin, along with the surrounding cities that acted just like them. So these angels left their own post that even Satan told them to do. They went AWOL on even Satan, and they went and did whatever they wanted to do for darker missions. So anyways, um, just kind of an insight. It's like, it's like opening it up, and you're just like, man, they, okay, there's character here. There's flaws here. There's even angels that left, that left heaven 
they didn't even want to obey Satan either. And they wanted to do their own thing, you know, like, like, like vigilantes, just doing their own thing. Second Peter chapter two, verse four says this. It says, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Remember when Jesus came across that man of the Gadarenes? And it says that he was full of demons. See, this might make more sense now. Remember, Jesus steps on the scene, and um, the demons in that man said, what have you come? You've come to torment us before our time. Do you not know that all of these demons were deathly afraid of God because they knew of those ones that were in chains for eternity? So when Jesus steps on the scene, they're like, oh, no, he's going to torment us before. He's going to throw us in with those crazies. He's going to make us go to that place before our time. Have you came to torment us before our time? They were deathly afraid of being put in chains with Apollon or Abaddon. Even demons are afraid of those in the deepest, darkest places in chains. That is why they were crying out to Jesus saying, please let us go into the pigs. Just whatever you do, please don't send us into the hole. Don't send us into solitary. They will do horrible things to me, in other words. You got to understand, demons are not friends. Demons have no love, no compassion, no nothing. There is complete hatred. They hate each other. They, 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 they destroy each other. So angels are created to operate out of structure. Remember I said that, angels. They're, they're created to operate out of structure and orders and ranking. And angels that don't stay in their own rank have been cast in chains until the judgment day. And it's highly likely that is why the demons were afraid when Jesus stepped on the scene and said, have you come to torment us before our time? Because they knew the time would come, but they didn't want it to happen that day. But nevertheless, angels are designed to obey orders, whether they're fallen angels or holy angels. They're still soldiers. So now the ones that have fallen now look after Satan. He's the one that commands them. He's the one that orders them. So they are still soldiers. You know, um, I'm going to show you this picture here. Let me get to it. All right. Not that picture. That picture. I want to read a verse as we look at this crazy war that's going on. Um, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 12, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael, there it is, Michael again. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and, in, and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, and woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Okay. This is the part, some of you have heard me say this, and some of you have never heard this, most believe, and if you believe this, 
at least give me these next few minutes before shutting it down. Most believe that Satan's fall from heaven, the war in heaven happened before creation. I was taught this as a child, that by the time Adam and Eve came, Satan had already had this huge war in heaven. And I want to share with you why I believe that didn't happen until the cross and the resurrection. Now, did he fall as far as into wickedness and sin? Yes, he fell way before, the cre well, before creation. That fall happened. But as far as the war in heaven, I believe it did not happen until the cross and the resurrection. And I'll show you why and I'll talk about it. Okay, this scripture here is talking about, about a war that broke out in heaven. And it says, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. So we know Michael is a warring angel. And he fought with that dragon. And they fought back and forth. They went back and forth. It says, and finally, um, there was no place in heaven found for Satan and his angels. If that happened in the beginning, for instance, how is it that he was in the, in the throne room of God with Job? If you remember Job, uh, God talked to Satan and said, where have you been? And he says, oh, I've been walking to and fro from the earth. So he had direct access into heaven. So if this war happened before that, how could he be in the throne room of God? It says here that there was a place found for them in heaven no longer. Now, part two, the second clue or the second thing that leads us to this is this. Light went out? Yes. Oh. It says that in verse nine, it says, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old. It's talking about the serpent in past tense. When do we see the serpent? In the Garden of Eden. So he would, if this happened before the creation, it doesn't make sense. It says here, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. How could he deceive the whole world if this war happened before the world was created? It says, he who deceives the whole world. So that means the world was in existence when the war happened. And it says here, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast with him. So there's many things here that show us that the war did not happen in the beginning. His fall happened in the beginning. His, his, his own fall, as far as when he rebelled. But as far as the war happened, it happened later. That serpent of old, that serpent from way back then. And if that doesn't seal it for you, let's look at the next few verses. It says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, so once he was kicked out, this voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Salvation didn't happen until the cross and the resurrection. So if a war happened in the beginning, why would they say now salvation has come? Salvation wasn't available until Jesus died on the cross and rose again. So what I'm trying to tell you is I believe in Scripture that while we were here fighting and seeing the Savior being whipped and dying on the cross and the earth shaking and the earth turning dark, if that was happening here on earth, what do you think was happening in the second heaven or in heaven? What do you think was happening? There was a battle going on. There was a fight going on. And when Jesus rose again, it makes more sense that now that Jesus has risen, for a loud voice in heaven saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. Did not Jesus talk about the kingdom that was going to come? It was Jesus who talked about the kingdom. And that next part of the verse says, and the power of his Christ has come. Christ didn't come until Christ came. None of these verses would make sense if you place the war 
in the beginning. This war happened afterward, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Why is this important? It's really important when it comes to your identity. This changes the whole thing. Okay, so, and then it says this, after, and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. If the war happened before, who was around for him to accuse? We know that if Job is true, and we know it's true because it's in Scripture, then actually this fits in line more because now that the cross came and the resurrection came, it says, man, that one that was accusing Job and accusing this, and he's always in the throne room accusing, always coming in accusing. That makes more sense. It fits the timeline more clear, like a piece of the puzzle that are just snapping together. It says, for the accuser of our brethren, he accused them before God day and night, all the time he has been cast down. And now here's the final nail to nail this thing. He says, and they overcame him. How did they win this war? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. So they won this war and finally kicked Satan out because of the shed blood of Christ. That was not at the beginning. That was later. And then to seal it even more, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. You know, I think I mentioned this before, but when somebody's an ambassador, we had an ambassador of Iraq here in the United States before the Iraq war. But the moment we declared war, that ambassador could not come into the United States. Everything was severed and everything was cut off. Satan was an ambassador of his kingdom of darkness, and he could go into heaven. That's how he can go and, and talk about Job and, and not have to face the repercussions because he wasn't from heaven. He was from the kingdom of darkness. So he was operating as an ambassador. But once war was declared, boom, that's it. You are no longer allowed here. So the moment Jesus died and resurrected, the very fact that Jesus resurrected was a declaration of war against the kingdom of darkness. And by that point, they said, you know what? You are no longer allowed in heaven. You are out of here. You have no access anymore. And it is done and it is finished. That's why when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he said it's finished to a lot of things. And one of the things was it is finished with your accusations. Your access has been revoked, bro. You are no longer allowed to accuse anybody in my throne anymore. It is done. It is war. It is on. So at that point, they were, and they were not able to win this war until Jesus came. Until the main general of all generals, until the main one, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies, finally sealed it because even as strong as as michael was this war was constant 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 but the blood of the lamb destroyed that war and ended the war right it, it, it just finished it off ended it that's why verse 12 check out verse 12 he says so this person that was screaming out yelling say now salvation has come now all these things in verse 12 it says therefore rejoice O heavens everybody in heaven we're gonna have a party man rejoice and everyone who dwells here in heaven but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time People say, why doesn't a Bible talk about Satan um, possessing people in the Old Testament? Because the war hadn't been declared yet. It wasn't until the resurrection, it wasn't until the resurrection that Satan got completely lost access to heaven, 
completely kicked out, completely thrown out, thrown down to the earth. He can't operate anywhere outside of the earth. Satan can't go to Mars. He can't go to the moon. He can't do none of that. He is stuck here on earth. It's almost like, a, like when you're in prison, if you're in a big prison, you can still walk around in the yard. You're not in the hole yet. You're just walking around, lifting weights, walking the track, going to the library, going to the chapel. Nevertheless, you're still concealed in this huge facility. Well, you know what? The earth is a huge facility for Satan. It's a constant reminder that he has the death chamber waiting for him. He's just walking the yard here causing havoc because even though somebody's in prison, they can't hurt people on the outside, but they can still hurt the people that are within the facility. Well, Satan is stuck in this facility and the only way he can hurt God is by hurting those that love God. So because of that, he's been thrown down and that's why they say, man, we're going to have a party here in heaven, but man, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, man. The devil has come down to you having a great wrath. He is mad. And he knows that he has a short time. So that's why I am saying that I believe that the war in heaven didn't happen until the cross and the resurrection, because it makes more sense it fills in blanks. It, it fills in a stronger foundation of how we see things. You know, in, um, I have it here. I don't want to read it, actually, because I already talked about it. I didn't realize I had it on this page. But basically, in Job 1.6, it talks about Satan going to and fro. Um, it talks about a lot of people automatically jump to just Job that was accused uh, but there's other times in the Bible, there's one specific time that we're going to read it right now. But uh, in Psalm 78, 42, 49, it says, They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the fields of Zoan. He turned their rivers into blood and their streams that they could not drink. He sent swarms of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar and their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to the hail and their flocks to fiery lightning. He cast on them the fierceness of his anger, his wrath and indignation and trouble by sending angels of destruction among them. You know, there's a lot of things that in this sense make more sense when you read the Old Testament and understand what happened in the Old Testament to the New Testament. In 1 Chronicles 21.1, it says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So we see this, this weird relationship that Satan had, and he could get into heaven and come back down and all this and that. Um, in 2 Chronicles 18, this is interesting, 2 Chronicles 18 18 to 23. It says, then Micaiah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. So this person seen a vision and it's God and his throne. And he sees the host. Remember host means army. So there's angels all around. And the Lord said, he asked a question from the throne room. He says, who, are, who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead. So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. Because we've got to remember, Ahab was wicked. So God is like, how are we going to have Ahab go into this place so he can basically die? In verse 20, it's interesting because it says, Then a spirit came forth and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So the spirit says, I'll do it. And God says, how are you going to do that? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. This is interesting. This is God talking to a spirit that is saying, I'll, I'll lie. I'll, call, I'll, I'll go and lie. I'll be a lying spirit. So we see these, these fallen angels were back and forth 
it was just a weird time. They still had access. In, in Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says this. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Right? It says, And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. It's, it's like, a, like a courtroom. Like you have a prosecutor and you have a, a criminal lawyer here. It's weird. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Israel rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked by the fire? So we see this weird interaction that Satan had access until the cross. And then everything ended at the cross. You know, in, in, in case anybody feels lost, I feel like I have to say this right now. This is where I'm going. I'm not trying to keep secrets just to have the big beautiful ending at the end. I'm trying to show you something, guys. Satan is not plotting against you to God. You are not Job. God is not allowing Satan to test you. You know, when things happen, oh, I have cancer because, you know, like Job, you know, Satan is accusing me and God is allowing Satan to give me cancer. No, that is not the case. The accuser has been thrown out of heaven. God does not give permission for any attack against you. God does not allow Satan. God does not say, hey, do what you will. Go ahead, test him. It doesn't work like that. You are not Job. I am not Job. We are not in that time. The fact is that the war happened at the cross and the resurrection, that your enemy, my enemy, has been thrown out of heaven, has no access. He knows he has a very short time. That is why his wrath is so great. That is why now he comes and possesses people. Now he comes to destroy people because he hates God so much, but he has no access into heaven. He can't touch God. And because he can't touch God, he's going to touch those that love God. And, and, and I'm hoping that this is what's establishing within you as we're going through this, because we're not here to learn about angels and demons. We're here to learn in a sense of how they operate, because I want you, once you realize how they operate, it helps us to understand who we are in Christ. It helps us to understand our placement and how important our placement is in Christ. We're not just called to just sit and warm a chair at a church. We are called to be soldiers. We are called to do damage to the enemy. Each and every one of you are called to find out the principalities and the strongholds of the enemy, and you have the authority to go and dismantle them. You know, and there's nothing that the enemy can do about that. So, um, in um, Matthew 4, 17, Jesus starts talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching about this kingdom, this kingdom, this kingdom. So in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 12, 28, Jesus says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So you got to remember this. Let me, let me do this. I don't want to just read scripture without putting any foundation here. So after the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan took control of the deed. And this whole world became a kingdom of darkness. Jesus comes and starts talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that was coming, the kingdom of God that would never fall, the kingdom of God that would dismantle the kingdom of darkness. So there, it's like Satan had a stronghold here in the earth for thousands of years, and all of a sudden, that kingdom finally has something to oppose it, and Jesus came to establish that kingdom. Jesus came to die for our sins, yes, but he also came to establish a kingdom, you know, and this is what we have to remember. We have to remember this at all times. We are not here to build um, individual kingdoms. This is what I mean by that. Um, a United States embassy in another country, even though it has its own authority, it has no authority if it doesn't have the country it came from. 
The only reason an ambassador has authority is because it's representing the bigger, greater nation that it's representing. So if you want to build a church, start a church, start a Bible study, do whatever, you are simply a satellite to the bigger kingdom. And here's the problem. A lot of pastors and leaders, they get it in their mind that they are they are the sovereign king of this little church that fits 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, when actuality, an ambassador is nothing more than a messenger for the main kingdom it represents. So it's like when we, that's why there's two types of churches, Christian churches, guys. We have to understand this. And I, I hate to say these things sometimes on Facebook or whatever, because it could get taken wrong. It could get taken like I have something against churches or I think House of Rest is better than, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this is that either we are a satellite to the kingdom and a church is simply that, a satellite. Or we're building something here that doesn't belong to that kingdom, you know? And unfortunately, all you're doing is becoming another stronghold for the enemy. You know, remember when Jesus was tempted and Satan took him up to the mountain and he says, look at all these kingdoms. If you worship me, I'll give all these kingdoms to you. Notice something. Notice Jesus didn't say, these kingdoms don't belong to you. Jesus didn't argue that fact. You know why? Because all these earthly kingdoms are under the domain of Satan. So if you have a church that you want to build here on this earth, then by default, who is Lord over it? That is why it's very dangerous to build your own kingdom, whether it's a church or a ministry a Christian rap label, whatever it is you want to do. And it's like, we, we don't want to build something here on earth because by default, it's under these principalities. I want to build my place in heavenly places. I want to have something that is directly attached to the kingdom of God. If Satan was an ambassador of darkness going into heaven as an ambassador, well, now the tables have been turned. Now he has no access into heaven, but the Bible says that we are ambassadors. Ambassadors to what? Ambassadors to the kingdom, because now we have access into the kingdom of darkness. And as an ambassador, the laws of this darkness of kingdom don't pertain to you. It don't pertain to me because I'm not from this world. I'm from heaven. I'm from the kingdom of heaven. And because I'm an ambassador of it, you can't touch me. That is why the ambassadors go with their limos, with the flags of their countries, because they have complete... Um, I can't think of the word right now, but the laws of the land that they're in can't touch them because they don't belong to that land. They belong to the land they came from. So us as Christians, if we could understand the fact that we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, that I am walking around in this kingdom of darkness and the laws of this place don't pertain to me, then that is going, then I will be able to walk in my God-given authority that he has given to me as an ambassador, as a representative of Jesus Christ, and these things don't pertain to me. So I'm going to come in here and destroy the works of the enemy. So, Jesus says in John 18, 36, Jesus answered, and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not here. In Luke 9, 12, it says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Jesus never said preach about the church. An ambassador does not brag about his embassy. He brags about the nation he comes from. We are not called to brag about the little church we're doing. The church is simply the embassy. That's it. 
Jesus didn't say go around and preach the churches. Go around. No, he says preach. He will start your little embassies, but preach about my kingdom. Whole different thing, guys. It's a whole different mindset. In case you're like, man, what is it? Why does David preach like that? It sounds different than what I heard the last 10 years, 15 years, 30 years. That is why. Because I'm not here to preach about house of rest. I am here to preach about the kingdom. House of rest is just the name. It's just a place that we chose to call our little embassy. Here's the thing. When, when we have, that's why when we move, have moved from church to church or the church door shut, it's because that's all it is. It's just an embassy. It, it, when, when they burned the Benghazi, okay, the Benghazi incident, when they burned and those poor people that were killed, the, the ambassador was killed. I mean, God bless his family, you know. But when that embassy was burnt, did that do? Did that destroy the United States? No. So why is everybody freaking out because the church doors are closed? I'm not freaking out because the kingdom is still going to be represented. The kingdom is still going to be out there. The kingdom, whether it's through internet, whether it's through letters, whether whatever, you can't stop the kingdom. It's when we get our, our we 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 make the embassy too important when it's about the kingdom. In Matthew 10, 5, 8, it says, these 12, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. There it is again, Jesus talking about the kingdom over and over and over. I have a few more. In Revelation 12, 10, oh no, actually we read that already, about Jesus, uh, the angel saying, now salvation and strength have come. So let's jump to Colossians 1, 13. It says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. So we were in the power of darkness. We were under the power of darkness. We belong to this kingdom of wickedness. But it says he has delivered us, meaning he saved us. Remember the, Egypt, uh, the Hebrews were delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. We have been brought over, saved out of darkness, and brought into the kingdom. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Talking about Jesus, he showed himself alive after the resurrection. It says, Being seen by them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Throughout the whole ministry of Jesus, he continually preached about the kingdom. He says, tell them about the kingdom that's coming. Tell them about the kingdom that's come. Every time you heal somebody in my name, tell them you were healed because of the kingdom of God has now reached you. The kingdom of God is now coming. The kingdom of God. That's what Jesus was constantly preaching. He never said to preach about the church. He established the church as a post in behind enemy lines. So when we start making it about the church, we are being very narrow-minded and not seeing the big picture. There's a difference between the church and the kingdom. For instance, in Hebrews 12, 28, Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Churches can be shaken. Churches can be burned down. Churches can be destroyed. Churches can be shut down. Uh, an invisible thing like a virus can close every church around the globe, but the kingdom cannot be shaken. So which one do you want to represent? I'm all about the kingdom. 
I want to belong to something that can't be shaken. I want to belong to something that can't be moved. You know, and, and it's like um, in Matthew 16, 18, I know it's getting long, guys, and, and I'm probably going to save the rest for the next part. Oh, wait. Rum oh, we're going to be finished right here. Three more verses and we're done. And then we'll open it up for question and answers. Matthew 16 and 18 says, and I also say to you that you, Peter, this is Jesus talking to Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. When Jesus said that, he was standing in the most wicked places. There's this place, literally, where the Jordan River comes out from, and there's a bunch, it's a rock formations, and over time, people have carved their gods all over it. Jesus took the disciples there to the most pagan, most wicked place, and he says, look, on this rock, yeah, I'm going to build my church. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means this. He goes, I'm going to come so strong and so powerful that I want you to build the church on top of every one of these principalities and dominions. I don't care what God, what, I don't care what Satan is doing in New York. I want you to build on this rock. I want you to build the church on San Francisco, in Las Vegas, in, in Los Angeles, in South Africa, all these so-called principalities and powers and things that Satan has. He goes, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against. In other words, he's saying, listen, nothing will be able to stop you. Nothing. Matter of fact, the gates of hell can't stop you from pulling people out constantly. That's what I want you to do is pull people out. Because these, these, these principalities, these demons, these, these thrones have been in place for so long that it's time for us to invade. It's time for us to quit being on the offense, to, to quit being on the defense and go on the offense and attack. So the church is not in a place right now to just sit back and wait to get to heaven. We have been declared, the war has been declared on the cross and the resurrection, and we are called to push through into the gates of hell, and there's nothing that hell can do to stop us. That's what that scripture is saying. Jesus said, and that most wicked place, he goes, man, all these false gods, man, on this rock, I'll build my church. And there's nothing these demons can do to stop it. That was a straight declaration of war, man. Because why? Because he's the general and he is the Lord of all hosts. So in Acts 5.11, it says, great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Because after the resurrection and Jesus ascended, people started getting healed. Demons started being cast out. The blind started to see. People that were, that were paralyzed began to walk and to feel power in their legs in Jesus' mighty name. You know, all of these things and everybody got afraid and everybody got scared because they had never seen anything like it. In Acts 8.1, I'm almost done, guys. Acts 8.1 says this, At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Remember, the church of Jerusalem, it was, it, was, it was an embassy. And they were scattered throughout all the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Why was there great persecution? Because Satan was thrown out of heaven, knowing he has a short time and has great wrath. And he has come to basically fight us, guys. It's a constant fight, but you know what? It's not us fighting alone. Because remember, even though demons are, are soldiers, so are the angels in heaven. The angels in heaven have weapons. They have chariots. They have horses. They have swords. They have power. And they were not afraid to fight these demons. They are not afraid to mess them up. You know, why do you think, like, like I have a friend that he says, why do you think some demons are missing ears and some are blind and some are cut and some walk funny? That's not a cartoon thing. In reality, if you ask people that have seen the demonic, they say, why do they always look all maimed and cut up and burnt and this and that? It's because they've been in fight with angels, man, because angels have been tearing them up for hundreds of years. Those swords of fire, they've been cut off ears and cut them off. They destroy and, and leave them with limbs broken and fingers missing and stuff like that. Why? Because the war is real. It's a real fight, guys. You know, um, last verse, Acts 8, 12. It says, when they believed Philip, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. 
So now they went out preaching about the kingdom. If you read all the books of the things that happened after Jesus, they were talking about kingdom, 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 kingdom. So why is it that now all you hear is church and ministry, church and church and ministry and church and ministry? That is not what the Bible was saying. It says that they were preaching about the kingdom of God. Why? Because Jesus was preaching about the kingdom of God. You know, so um, I, I did have some more, but I'm going to add that to part three, guys. We're going to talk about the identity of Satan, and then we're going to go into the identity of Jesus. Actually, that might be a better fit together with part three. Um, but we do have these books. I can send you the PDF for it. I don't mind for free, but if you want us to send you one they're twenty dollars and they're they're bound they're pretty nice you know and you can just keep it but if not i'll send it to you free just go print it go to kinko's and print it or fedex whatever anyways um guys uh i'm gonna I'll go ahead and is anyone here that has any questions um huh yeah raise that little hand uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch, look at me. I have this little hand on mine. See that? It's under reactions. And you can unmute yourself if you have a question. I know it's going to be kind of late. Uh, but if there's anyone with a little hand. <laughs> Brother, Tony. Brother Tony, where are you at? Where are you at? How come I don't see him? Uh, unmute Hello. yourself. Where are you at? Hi. Hello. Okay. So uh, I take a lot of comfort the last this last year before the pandemic. Um, a lot of people at my church uh, were a big uh, mega. We were like a lot of mega hats in our church. Not yeah. that I'm, I'm, we're an exception, but a lot of mega hat weren't. And, uh, and I'd see them like bickering and complain about uh, the way things are and um, all the conspiracies against their president, our president. And then I would be like trying to find comfort in saying something like, you know, that this is our kingdom on earth and God would fight for us. So if our president falls from his grace or whatever, it's okay. It's, it's not our kingdom to, to be so much bothered about, man. The kingdom that I want to be part of is the kingdom that fights against abortion. And, 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 and I'm sorry, the kingdom that I want to be part of doesn't have abortion, doesn't yeah. have pornography, doesn't have uh, murders, and doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, torture, doesn't have greed. That's the kingdom I want to be part of. So... Um, I tell that to my brothers in this church, and they don't get it. They're like, well, that's all good, but we need a president. So yeah. um, so what, what would you say about that? Because there is like a theology, I think it's called kingdom theology, where yeah. basically it's like, you know, the world's the crap, but you know, it's not our kingdom. So, you know, we just love our neighbor and love God and, 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 and keep moving forward and looking for a future kingdom. But um, what, do you say, what, what do you say about that? Like just... Uh, um, Finding comfort that this is not our kingdom, right? I yeah, know. I mean, we're, we're just passing through this place, you know, do, it's like, it's another thing too, is that um, I think for at a certain level, we always want to be conscious of what's going on in our government. I think now in the days though, people have taken a little too far and all of a sudden everybody's an expert at everything. I think that we're putting too much trust in whatever president, you know, every president I have had in Christ, I have always prayed for them. Whether it was Obama, whether it's Trump, whoever's going to be next, and even Bush, does that mean that they were perfect? No, because you know what? There's only one that's perfect, and that's God. And we can't take our eyes off of that. All my prayer, my prayer, this is why I pray for Trump. Because if he falls, we fall as a nation. And whoever's president after him, if they fall, so it's like we, by not praying for a president, we're in a sense not praying for our own selves. You know, so with, by praying for those, but I think that a lot of Christians for whatever, I think that there's um, nothing wrong with saying, you know what, I'm glad I'm American. You know, I'm glad because this is a great nation, even though there's not everything's perfect, it's a great nation. But I think there's a, a spirit of patriotism also that can turn evil and wicked also. You know, so we got to be real careful and remember what kingdom as believers we belong to. It doesn't mean we're oblivious because we have a right to vote. Hey, there's a people in this world that can't vote. So we should. There's, there's nothing wrong with paying attention to those things, but don't forget where it is we come from. We are not of this world. That's what the Bible says. You know, so what are we going to do? Are we going to listen to what the word says? Or are we going to listen to what the masses say? You know, um, and, 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 and I, I get, I don't think you asked this, but I, I want to say this. Be real careful when we say, 
that we want a Christian president. Because I'll tell you why. Because if, 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 if Trump or any president is going to push Christianity on us, and we're like, yeah, 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 what if the next president is Muslim? You know, we got to be real careful. I, I, I don't, God never called us to be a Christian nation. He called us to be Christians. Because in the same way, in the same sense, I don't want the masses, because if all of a sudden there's more Muslims than there is Christians, then what does that mean? So I don't want, I want the separation of church of state. The separation of church of state was not to protect the government. It was actually to protect the church, you know? And it's like, so we, we shouldn't want that mix. We don't want that because what if the beliefs of the next president or next whatever, we don't want those lines blurred between church and state. You know, I don't know if that has anything to do with what you said, but I just kind of felt like I, I wanted to say that. Um, That's any, perfect. That was a perfect yeah. answer. Thanks, brother. All right. Um, anybody else? Anyone? Oh, Mary Brown. Mary Brown. Go ahead and unmute yourself, sis. Mm -hmm. Greetings. Hello. Hi. That was fabulous. Fantastic. It answered a lot of questions I've been dealing with. And, and this is really, really awesome. Uh, this question goes to um, the angels. Yes. I'm after losing my mom, my dad, my brother. I have people, well, many people, and it um, it kind of troubled me. I didn't say anything, but they said, now you have guardian angels to watch you. Yeah. So I'm sure all of us are sometime in our, we've been told that. So I don't know what to think. And I searched the scriptures. Um, I know that God's always protected me and he's always guided me. And he le leads me, so I don't. I, I'm, I'm. I guess I. Am I wrong to say? No, they're not guardian angels. Yeah, the we don't. The Bible never says that we become angels. Those are a whole different species. It's a whole different being. You know, so um, we don't become angels. I know it sounds great. It sounds nice to tell somebody that at a, at a funeral or celebration of life. Oh, you know, they're angels mm -hmm. now. But the fact is that, that it, you know, if they're in Christ, if they made the choice that they're in the presence of the Almighty God, but we don't yeah. transform into something else. Angels are angels. They always will be angels. We are humans. We will always be humans. Um, you know, but I do want to say this, that the Hebrew people do believe that we are given uh, guardian angels, that we are assigned angels. And it makes sense because even, the, <laughs> even witchcraft or Santeria, for example, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's basically, yes. okay. Those people, um, my understanding is when they come into Santeria, they are given these beads and they are assigned two spirits. Those yeah. two spirits are theirs and that's how they do their bidding. That's how they curse people and bless people. They send their yes. spirits out to do their biddings. And um, if that person ever wants to stop doing Santeria, those two spirits will now turn and they will torment the person now. You know, and um, the reason I say that is because anytime something is counterfeited, anytime <laughs> Satan counterfeits something, yeah. it's because he's counterfeiting something that had value, something that was real. Mm. That makes sense? You're not yes. going to counterfeit a $15 bill because that doesn't make sense. You would only yeah. counterfeit something that's real and has real value. So the fact that Satan does that and has assigns to spirits and uh -huh. the fact that the Jewish people believe that we do have guardian angels, that, that we are assigned angels to watch over you. Uh -huh. It's an interesting, you know, but are they your parents or anybody? No, they're not. They're angels. No. Angels are angels. Yeah. So I just be nice and say thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Don't argue with anyone about it. No. Because honestly, they're trying to say, they're just trying to comfort yeah, you. To comfort me. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Anybody else? <laughs> Tramel, where is he at? Tramel, you can you unmute yourself? Oh yes, I can. How y'all doing? Good, brother. Good. My question, I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to ask, but I said let me just go ahead and ask because I had been wondering for a while. A uh, few of my friends and I, we talk, um, and oftentimes about real deep stuff. But we talk about science, otherworldly beings, and how they find in, uh, proof of life on other planets. Um, I was told by a guy that I kind of trusted in spiritually that uh, when I asked him about it, he said yeah. that 
basically beings from other planets are demons, as he mm -hmm. understands it. But then in a the lesson, we see that the devil only has dominion over the earth. Yeah. So do you, do you have any insight on that? There's two things that I could say. I don't, I'm just, obviously this is opinion. I don't know. Um, number one is that I, I will never argue with somebody whether there's other creations somewhere else. I'll tell you why. Because God can do anything he wants to do. You know, the Bible is pertained to the people that are here on the earth. We're here on the earth. It ain't my business what he's doing a million miles away. Or, you know what I mean? So that's one thing is that if, if there was ever proven that there was another intelligent whatever somewhere else, God is still their God because he's the God of the universe. He's not the God of the earth. So it's still under the realm of God because the Bible says that all of the universe cannot contain God. So I would never try to supersede and say, God didn't do this, God didn't do that. I don't know. And it doesn't really, it's never, it's not going to change my, my salvation, you know, whether he chose to create something somewhere else or not. The second part, I think what, what maybe you misunderstood, I'm not sure what they said is demons. Um, many people believe that demons are, cause they show signs and wonders. We see it in the book of revelation that they, it's not that they're, live in aliens because they're bound to this earth but they can give an illusion as if there's aliens or ufos or whatnot to to deceive us because if they can trick us into believing there's aliens then maybe we would not believe in god remember his his main thing is to cause us to to derail and if he can prove that because what if the what if the rapture's coming and satan knows so he's trying to set up the, the those that stay behind to think well aliens got them <laughs> you know so he's trying to deceive and trying to cover up everything that god is doing so um that could very well be it not that they are outer space aliens but they could make themselves appear to be just to deceive the world gotcha. okay. but like i said that's opinion i don't know i you know i kind of thought about that myself too sometimes so thank you all right brother Anybody else? I don't see any hands. Anybody? No? Uh, David over there. Uh, can you unmute yourself, brother? Hey, how's it going? Good, brother. Good. I have a question for you. Um, it sounds like kind of not weird, but my, um, my grandma's sister, she lives in Florida now, but she, you know, she's from LA, from SoCal. Yeah. And she was when she was younger she was a pastor she did like she did bible missionaries in italy like sicily like that's where where like my dad's from you know so yeah. that's like where she brought my dad over and everything like that i asked her a question like about um 15 years ago and it blew my mind and i wanted to ask you the same question because it's, it's like about revelation okay. because like it's it's real deep you know what i'm saying and it's yeah. like hard for me to kind of i asked her straight up i said to her she's like in her 80s now so i said to her I said, what, I said, uh, Aunt Carol, I said, what, in your opinion, is the mark of the beast? And the answer that she told me, just like, what she told me just blew my mind and I didn't know what to say. So what, what would, like, for example, your interpretation be of that? Um, <clears throat> well, what's interesting to me is the fact that a lot of those verses in Revelation are, are, even though that was written 2000 years ago, the, the, that prophetic word, a lot of things have happened since then at the time when John wrote it. For instance, there's a lot of things that people don't know. For instance, um, at the time when John wrote the book of Revelation, in the next coming year, something happened. In the next few years after that, that he wrote that, the emperor of Rome declared himself a god, built temples around all of Rome at that time, and he made a decree. And he said, and if you don't come and worship and light incense unto my altar, then for that year, you cannot buy, sell, or trade anything. This happened a few years after John wrote it. So there's a lot of things in Revelation that either happened or they were a shadow of what's about to happen in a bigger, in a bigger sense also. So I'm not declaring, I'm not sitting here saying that, the beast or the antichrist is done or it's gone. I'm not saying that, but it's interesting how historically speaking in his present, in his time, it was future. 
because that did happen where Christians could not buy, sell, or trade and without that, that piece of paper that had the mark of that Roman emperor. You know, and that's what the scripture says, that without the mark of the beast, you cannot buy, sell, or trade. You know, but what is the, <clears throat> I think it's more of a spiritual thing, honestly, because the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit sealing us on our foreheads. Mm -hmm. The Bible also says that. So one part of me says, if that, okay, I understand that happened back then, but let's say now, is the Antichrist rising? Is there an Antichrist? Is he here already? And what is the mark of the beast? Is it really a chip? Is it a tattoo? Is it just something spiritually? You know, um, I think all of those questions are good questions. Like, for instance, right now, people are making a big deal about the chips or the vaccine. I mean, they're only taking the vaccine because it's going to be chipped, this and that. When people take the mark of the beast, whenever, whatever that is, you're not going to get tricked into it. You're not going to get tricked and you have a flu and somebody gives you a vaccine and like, oh, I got the mark now, I'm going to hell now. And God's like, oh man, man, you almost made it in heaven, but you went and got that vaccine listening to Bill Gates. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like that. When somebody takes the mark, it's like you are going, you are saying, I want this mark. I want this, whatever it is. I don't know, you know, honestly, I, I could sit here and just ramble on. I don't know, but I do know this, that when whoever takes the mark of the beast is going to blatantly do it against God because they hate God, they're not going to be tricked into it. In the same way, those of us that have the mark of the Holy Spirit, we don't accidentally stumble into the kingdom. We surrendered our life to God. So in the same way, you're going to surrender your life to Satan or to whatever it is that that world view, you know. Um, but, you know, to, I do know that, um, the chipping though, I will say this with a chip, I don't believe that a vaccine with a chip is the mark, but I do believe that if it is going to be a physical mark or chip, then that is just simply the building blocks toward that technology that the antichrist will use. But I don't believe that we're going to get tricked right. into a vaccine and accidentally take the mark of the beast. I don't believe that because it's not going it, to, scripture never says anything like that, you know, but I do believe that um, us moving into a cashless society, us using less cash and more debit card, us using barcodes, um, chips being put in people in Mexico, they put them in people now and rich people because a lot of people get, uh, um, uh, kidnapped in Mexico. Kidnapped. So a lot of them get right. chipped on purpose. That way they can find them. So I don't mm -hmm. believe they're going to hell and they have the mark of the beast. I just believe that the technology for that is moving forward in that direction. You know, right. but I don't think the mark of the beast is existing yet in a physical thing, but I think people have taken upon the mark of the beast in their hearts. Right. Yeah, so I don't I don't know. That's what I'm that's what I think. She actually, the crazy answer, uh, not crazy, but the thing that like really blew my mind was I was talking to her and then she's like, I asked her and then she's like, she said that thing right there and she pointed to the computer and that was it. And this was yeah. like 15 years ago. This was like before MySpace, you know what I'm saying? And I yeah. was like, huh, that didn't, I was like, okay. And then now that time goes on more than I'm just kind of like starting to, um, yeah, you know, to, uh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, this is crazy. Just the other day, I was listening to, um, I was listening to, um, what's his name? Uh, no, the podcast guy. Oh, I, I listen to him a lot. He's a comedian. Joe Rogan? Yeah, I was listening to Joe Rogan. He was interviewing yeah. um, uh, Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. Have you guys heard of that thing called, what's it called? Oh, this thing where he, he's putting to put in your brain. Um, I can't think of the name right now. It doesn't even matter what the name is, but it's this chip that he's doing to help people with epilepsy, uh, mm -hmm. people that have um, uh, just different things with their body. It's this chip that wherever the part is in their brain, they basically drill a hole and they put, they replace that piece of the, and it's the, huh? Neur yeah, Neuralink. And uh, it puts these prods into your brain and it helps you. 
And Joe Rogan straight up asked him, what's the future of this? Because he goes, I know how you are, Elon Musk. You're steps ahead and what you're, what you're thinking. He goes, well, I wanted to start off with this. He goes, but eventually, he goes, I wanted to be able for people to be able to communicate without even talking. He goes, we're about five or 10 years away from not even having to talk. We could just, everybody will have that Neuralink in there and you can literally like Bluetooth, I could send you a picture from my brain to your brain. Now that sounds crazy, right? Uh, yeah, and so Joe Rogan, you know Joe, if you watch him, he just like, he lets the guy just keep going because it just sounds yeah. insane, you know? Yeah. But, but this guy is one of the richest guys in the world, if not the, and he's very dead serious, he goes, he goes, it's building to the point of, he goes, whether I see it or not, that we will be able to build bodies that if your body is busted and broken, then that thing could just extract everything, every memory, every thought, everything, and just put it into that new body. And now you, you are that person now. You know, <laughs> and I'm just like, what? Wow. And, and this is not just hearsay. I just look at it. You know, you hear him talking. This is the guy that invented, you know, Tesla and all this other stuff. So, He's talking about replacing bodies and this and that. So anyways, I say that to say this. This is weird because there's a part of Scripture Revelations that never made sense to me until I saw that. Okay. The Bible says that the beast would build uh, basically a statue or an idol. And all of a sudden, that idol would begin to speak. So this thing that had no life, all of a sudden is given life. And all of a sudden, this guy's talking about building these bodies because the Bible says that the Antichrist, they'll kill him and somehow he will come back and the whole world will wonder and worship the beast. Mm. You know, and then I thought, and it just, and, and I could be, and I'm not saying this is this, but I'm saying this is moving toward this is moving toward the direction that Elon Musk was like, yeah, if your body gets destroyed or if you get paralyzed or hurt or busted up or broken, then they'll just take out the Neuralink, put it into this body that we made. And now that body becomes you and you'll think you're you. You won't even realize you did that. And it's just crazy. Yeah. Rev Revelation 13, 13, 15. Watch, check this out. Never made sense to me. And I'm not saying this is what this is that but i am saying okay this is moving in that direction uh revelation 13 15 says um he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed so this image begins to speak and have life that's crazy you know so i don't know <laughs> Man, I hope I hope I'm already gone before I see that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but you know, yeah, that's a good question, but I don't want to go on and on cuz we're not really doing a study on that, but it's just interesting stuff, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank sure. you, brother. Yeah. Thank Is you. there anybody else? Cuz we're already, it's getting late. It's already two and a half hours in. Okay, Trinity. Unmute yourself, brother. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um so I'm under, like, I live near the res. Well, I am on the res, uh, the Navajo Nation. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the scripture on, um, you know, the rock, and there's all these different type of, I guess we can say, religions. Yes. Um, so on my res, you know, since I became a follower of Christ, it's it's kind of difficult. Like, you know, there's there's some people that say, like, well, the Navajo or the, the old traditional religion is of the devil and this and that. and you know, it's like very black and white in that perspective. But as I'm learning and going along, it's like it, it's hard to minister and yeah. reach out, you know, to the ones who really need it. Because, you know, for so long, we went by that teaching of, you know, that's the evil way and whatnot. And yeah. like, you know, historical trauma over time kind of just, uh, you know, turned a lot of my people against Christianity. So, so my question is kind of like, so, so how do you see that? Do you see like, you know, um, that that's the right way is to just kind of, uh, you know, say that the old ways are bad and it's evil? Because um, like the way I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I would say this, there's Paul, the apostle Paul went to Greece and Athens and um, he noticed that there was a bunch of gods. 
they have statues for everything, Zeus and Medusa. And, you know, like if you watch Clash of the Titans, all those different gods, he had a choice to make. He said, you know what, if I could sit here and tell them all of these are bad and all of these are demonic and nobody's going to listen to me and I'm going to waste my time arguing. And instead, he looked at the situation. He saw one statue that said to the unknown God, like they believed in so many gods that they made a statue of the unknown God in case they missed a God. That way that God wouldn't get angry. So they made a statue for the unknown God. And he's like, you know what? See that right there, the unknown God? I'm going to tell you about him. Anyways, so he used their religion. He used their thing to point to God. He did it in a way where he didn't offend. He found a way. He, in other words, he says, to the Greek, I became a Greek. To the Roman, I became a Roman. To the Navajo, I'm going to talk like a Navajo. To the Mexican, I'm going to talk. You know what I mean? So in other words, you don't want to offend people to the point where now they're not going to hear you. You got to find a way in which to do it, you know? And, and I can't really say exactly what, because I don't know what, what the belief system is for the Navajo, you know what I mean? But you got to find a way um, like that, because we're called to win them over, not to win arguments. I don't know if that helps at all or anything, but um, we see yeah, that that's yeah, what Paul that, did. That kinda, yeah, and that kind of helps because, you know, it's very, like, conflicting. I mean, kind of like the old school um, I guess they call it like the old school religion, like the old school evangelists that were around, like maybe yeah. in the eighties, yeah. you know, that's kind of what they preached. But for me, I'm kind of, uh, now I'm learning on my own. It's kind of like, I kind of see that you win them through the love of Christ. Exactly. Over, you know, arguments, like you said. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and I think you're, you're on the right path, brother. You're on the right path. Is there uh, anyone else before we end it? No? Go ahead. My wife's going to say something. Yeah, I just want to thank you for you just taking the time to do this for all of us. You know, I know I'm your wife and everything, but <clears throat> I know you put a lot into this and you put a lot of study and effort into what you do. So I just want to thank you for that. Welcome. I, I really do. Welcome. Thank you. All right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. So it's going to sound crazy again, but let's say our goodbyes. Uh, unmute all. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. Oh, Thank you so much for taking the time, brother. I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. Amen, mm -hmm. Alex. God bless you, brother. God bless yeah. you, bro. Um, I have a I have a question for Eva. Eva, what were you feeling earlier? Uh, I was feeling I, I don't know, just overwhelming. Not overwhelming, but it was an excitement kind of like, you know, because I know that, you know, the Lord has been really like um showing me a lot of things and these angels and was you no know, evidence to um it was just knowing that God was you and he's teaching you more and more. So I was not crying because I was sad. I was crying because... Yeah, you're overwhelmed with the, all the goodness, right? It's such a man. Amen. I'm blessed to hear that. Amen. All right. Well, I think we're going to end it now. And uh, God bless you. Thank you so much, oh, every single you. one of you. Thank you. Thank Let you so quick, much. By the way... Thank you. You guys don't have to text the uh, the text that number. I wrote everybody's name that was on here while you guys were looking away. So I got everybody to put everybody in the raffle, okay? Okay. So next week I'll be drawing another I'll be drawing another one. So yeah. don't worry about texting. I got everybody on here. Amen. Brother David, make us some spread. I know, I'm about to. <laughs> oh, don't encourage him anymore right now. <laughs> How's that? We'll come in and eat dinner. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming over. All right. Uh -huh. six, six feet apart, but we could do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> About 800 feet apart, 800 miles apart. Um, you guys could jump on the plane right over here. Come on down. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Sound like All right. your dad. 
All right, guys, we got to go. God bless you. Thank you so Bye, much. Guys. Love you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.